Today we'll be talking about how to build your very own teaching assistant program. But first, what is a teaching assistant? Well, at the very basic level, it's somebody who can help you teach your course, as I'm sure we would all love to have, somebody to help us manage the classroom, to distribute assignments, to even to grade and give feedback. And there are many things, many responsibilities, a teaching assistant could do, or a TA for short. Today I want to show you just a few of what um, a few of the responsibilities we have TAs here at Harvard take on, but allow you to think through what you'd like to actually invent in your own classroom and what actually works for you. So here at CS50 on campus, uh, here at Harvard and at Yale, having these TAs has been almost something of a necessity given the size of our class. So last fall, we enrolled something like 600 students in the fall, and so we had a staff, mem a staff that looked a bit like this, like 80 or so staff members who helped us teach that class. And I want to show you this photo just to kind of show you that there's so much to see. There's not just one person, not just a uh, you know, five person team, but so many staff will help build and support CS50 overall. So this was the staff here at Harvard. We also had staff at Yale who came for the hackathon too. So big staff across both Harvard and across Yale. And this is kind of the culmination of several years of building up this teaching assistant program and trying to support these undergraduates and actually working with us. So first off, there's a question about the goals of a teaching assistant program. Like, Why would you have one? And I want us to first talk to ourselves here, do a bit of a think, pair, share, and think through this question. If you were to have, or maybe you already have, a TA program or a teaching assistant program, what would your goals for it be? And for this think, pair, share, we'll have you all first think to yourselves, talk to someone next to you, and eventually we'll share out some ideas. And again, the question here is, if you were to have, or maybe you already have, a TA program, what would your goals for it be? So we'll take two minutes here, talk to someone next to you, we'll come back and share out. OK, and that's just about two minutes, so let's come on back. And if I could just ask the room, would any pair like to share what you discussed? What would be your goals for your TA program? What goals would you have? Can I go over here? Give me a microphone. Um, one goal we said was that um, it would be to have students in the class feel more supported. Nice. So a good goal for a TA program would be to have students in the class just feel more supported. They have more people they can ask questions to, more people to get help from. A great goal for a TA program. Any other goals for a TA program? Yeah, go over here. Um, to give some extension to the kids who are the, doing the TA work um, nice. so that they can kind of further their knowledge and stay in practice. Yeah, I like that thinking. So just to reiterate, it's not just about the students, too. We also want to give opportunities for those who are TAs to further their experience in the field, to practice teaching, to deepen their knowledge, and so on, by being a teacher. And often, we learn best by teaching. So similarly, in CS50, we have a, probably a few goals for our TAs, one of which is that, in the end, students actually remember their experience with their TA, that they remember their experience positively, not just the semester after or the year after, but hopefully even like the decade after. They remember this person who got them into computer science and helped them realize they could have a place in that field. And similarly, we also hope that TAs grow as teachers when they join us. We want them to stay with us, not just for one year, not just one iteration of the course, but hopefully multiple, growing as they spend time with us. So these are our two fold goals, a goal for students and a goal for teachers, or the TAs as well. So let me give you some context of what we do at Harvard. And I want to preface this by saying, again, we've built this up over the course of several, several years. And you can take bits and pieces from this that suit you. Maybe you're just starting out, but I want to show you where we've at least ended up after many, many years of work on this. So this past fall, we had what we called nine heads for the course. 45 teaching fellows, and 27 course assistants. And each of these people have different roles on our teaching staff. So we decided to actually not have only one kind of TA, but actually multiple kinds of TAs, each having their own specialized role in that class. 
So first, for our teaching fellows, they will lead what we call a weekly section. So students in CS50 will go to a lecture with David. They'll hear concepts introduced. And they'll then go to what we call a section, which is more hands-on, designed to give them practice actually programming, led by one of our TAs later that week. And then when students submit their work to the class, they will receive feedback from that very same TA. That TA will grade their work, give them feedback on how to improve it week by week by week. And of course, throughout that week, this staff member might also hold office hours, which are basically chances for students to come in and ask questions unprompted. They can simply show up, ask questions, and get help on the fly. So many responsibilities for our teaching fellows. And on average, this takes about 10 hours a week on average. So our course assistants, because we want to just hold more office hours, their sole responsibility is holding office hours. They don't hold section. They don't grade work. They just help us offer more times for students to actually get help from a member of the teaching staff. And then for those who tend to return, either one year or two years over time, we have this role called a head. And a head is somebody with more experience who helps lead a cohort of staff members. This past fall, we had, again, nine heads. And each head led about six or seven staff members. They helped them grow as teachers, often when they were just beginning their time as a TA. And they met weekly to talk about how to improve their teaching, what was going on in the course, and so on. We've also found it helpful to have heads take ownership of some element of the course, whether it's the office hour scheduling, whether it's answering emails, pairing students up with study buddies. Sometimes uh, course management gets delegated to heads to help us make sure things just run smoothly in the course. So these are our three kinds of roles, at least here at Harvard. And again, you can take what you want to from this. This is not necessarily the answer to all the questions of how to build a TA program. So let me pause here and ask any questions so far. Yeah. Carter, how many students are being served by this program? Great. So usually a question was, how many students are being served by this program? And by that, do you mean students who are taking CS50 or students who are in the TA program? Uh, students. Students who are taking CS50. Correct. Yeah. So usually we enroll between, let's say, 500 and 700, at least in recent years. And so usually we have about a ratio of 1 to 12, about on average across our staff members. Um, but sometimes higher, sometimes lower, depending on comfort level of the students. Per semester? Per semester. Um, and our fall course is much bigger, for example. Um, in the spring, we have a smaller version of CS50, and we employ much fewer uh, TAs, usually around six or so in total. Yeah. Other questions on this context for Harvard? Yeah. Are these all undergraduates, or is it graduate students and undergraduates? Yeah, great question here. So the question was, are these all undergraduate students, or are they also graduate students, or are people in the community? Um, the answer is, at least for the college class, they are mostly undergraduates. So people who took the class in a prior year wanted to learn how to teach it and joined us for that reason. Um, and we'd say uh, most tend to stay at least one year, and then some join for their junior year, and um, a few tend to join for their senior year as well. Other questions on the context here? All right. So. Let's keep going. And a question that we often get is, how do we actually recruit these staff members? So if you're thinking of building your own TA program, well, how would you find the students to help work in this class and gain experience as teachers? And for us, we've actually changed this many, many, many times over the course of several years. But we've landed on this kind of model. So first, we just tend to try to encourage applications. Like, just come join us on staff. We try to encourage this in a few different ways. I mean, one, we know students who took the class and did well. We'll tend to email them and say, hey, what would, you, would you like to join us on staff and actually help teach the course next year? We'll also allow staff to refer other staff. So often, as we said, these teaching fellows will lead a section, maybe 12 to 18 students, depending on comfort level, and they get to know them very well. And we'll ask those staff members, did you notice any student who might have expressed interest in teaching or who might have wanted to join us as a staff member? And we'll also intentionally say, could you refer us not just the, the, you know, the, the boy or the man in your classroom, but also the woman as well. Get them inspired and to join our teaching staff too. 
And then finally, we have events, these events that we actually try to recruit students at as well. So we'll have puzzle day, the fair, these kind of bombastic things that tell students this is fun to be on staff. You want to join us. You want to be part of this and help us organize that too. These are kind of three ways we try to recruit students on our, onto our staff. And once we encourage applications, we do actually try to interview students. We find it's helpful to meet them in person, to encourage them again to keep joining us. And in this interview, we try to do three different things. We try to ask students, why are you want, interested in joining us? Like, what's your motivation for being on staff? Often they'll say, I want to learn more about CS, or I want to practice teaching, or I really found, I love the relationship I built with my staff member that I had last year. We'll also have them undergo a teaching simulation where they'll prepare their very own um, lesson and deliver it to us on staff. And we'll get, get a feel for how well they deliver it, what, uh, how creative were they while they were delivering this lesson. And then, if we have time, we'll also have them do simulated office hours. It is trying to pose a question to them, some buggy code, and seeing how they actually respond to that and guide a student through that scenario in some version of office hours. Students are asking questions on the fly. And actually, we've tended to find that we can do these in about less than 10 minutes per one person before we kind of know whether they're a good fit or if they might want to reapply again in the future. So let me pause here and ask any questions on our recruitment so far. All right. So then, once we have an idea of who we want on our staff, we'll make staff offers. And historically, we've tended to do something like actually sending physical letters to students to get them to actually like, be excited about opening it and seeing that and so on. Now we rely more on email, but make it an excited looking email as well. Um, and then we also try to, perhaps more importantly, retain our current staff. So it's great to try to um, recruit new staff, but I find it's often great to try to um, keep the staff who developed that experience already to stay with us over time. And there are a few ways uh, to do this. One way I found is just send an email that lets people know we want you back on staff. And so this is an email I sent at the end of last semester with highlighted in bold here. If you want to join us again next fall, tell us here. This call to action. Please let us know early if you're interested so I can reach out to you and let you know that I want you to return. And if I don't get that interest, but I know somebody was really great, I'll actually just reach out myself and say, hey, I thought of you. I want you to join. Something as simple as this is actually very helpful for trying to find folks who want to return and who are able to return as well. And then simply, it's a lot about relationship building, too. So this is a picture at our last, um, our last hackathon uh, with me and some TAs here. Uh, just the, the top one's not a very good photo. But it's kind of a fun one. And just building these relationships is kind of important to trying to, have, trying to um, get folks to return and keep with it over time. All right. So again, what questions do you have before we turn it over and bring up some folks who are actually on staff? How many, How many? students indicate that they would like to participate? Great. Yeah, great question. So the question was, how many students have indicated they want to participate in the TA pr program? Mm -hmm. So usually we'll have interest from, I would say, maybe 100 or so students. And we're actually able to offer staff slots to most of them. So it's not like this is a very competitive position, um, but it is uh, great that we're able to offer those to most people who want to join us in the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just the scale of the class. So if we have 600 students in the class, it's not that hard to get 100 who want to join the staff. That's like one six or so. OK. So I thought we'd turn things over to a little bit of advice. But who better to give advice than those who are actually currently on staff? So let me invite Andrew, Patrick, and Charlie up here to do a bit of a Q&A with them and their experiences being on CS50's staff. We'll do a bit of a, a fireside chat here virtually. <laughs> And we'll ask a few questions that I had made up front, but later on we'll turn over to Q&A from you all. So feel free to think of questions you might want to ask our staff here. All middle, OK. All right, folks. So before we start, can you all just say your names again, going back and forth? Sure. I'm Andrew. I'm a student here at Harvard. And I've TF'd CS50 twice. Hi, my name is Charlie. I'm a head TA for CS50 at Yale. And I've been a TA for CS50 at Yale since my sophomore year of college. Hello, I'm Patrick. I'm another student at Harvard, CS major, and I've uh, <laughs> I've TA'd Harvard like a 
I'm sorry. THC is 50. I swear in excess of like six or seven times at this point. So um, happy to meet you all. A round of applause for you all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question we thought we'd ask is, uh, what has been a challenge that you've had while you've been TAing for CS50? And what kinds of support did either the, 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 the teacher could offer or CS50 offer that helped you in that scenario? Or what kind of support did you want that we actually didn't have for you? Okay. Sure. Um, I can say that the reason that I and many people joined the uh, staff at CS50 was that they took CS50, usually freshmen, like their very first semester of college. And the, given that it's such a, like a monstrosity of a class, like it's huge and the lectures are massive and take place in a theater, like the main human connection you have is with your uh, TA who's uh, in your section with you and uh, can, you can contact any time for like uh, advice on PSETs or just the future or a CS in particular. Uh, for me, that was with someone named Ashley who was fantastic. Um, and that, uh, that was, that I remember being like the big, uh, like the, that helped me as a, with the challenges as a student and that helped me as, uh, and that same level of community, like for heads and things like that, helped me as uh, a TF to tackle those challenges as well. So I don't know if you guys have comparable experience in terms of that. I'm not sure I can take it. Yeah, I guess in terms of a challenge, I think uh, the main thing I would think of is when you're teaching a section is obviously you have students going at different paces. Um, that's often super challenging. Uh, Patrick had the worst example of this that we, he, Patrick taught a uh, lab of or a section of about 100 people, I think, last semester. Uh, you know, I had it scaled down. I was only teaching about 15 people at any one time. But it's still within that like quite a big variety. I think for me, the best solution we have to that is our tutorial system. You have six students, 60 minutes. That's quite personalized. You know, there's not a lot of classes here where we have, you know, it's the biggest class we have here in terms of computer science, but it's in terms of like interaction on like a low level, unless you want to get up for, you know, the rare like 7 a.m. office hours here we have at other classes, which, you know, aren't exactly popular. That's one way of getting like easy support at other classes. The fact that we cap things at six people for 60 minutes gives you quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. And also, like, the six people, as we see here, we can, like, get six people pretty commonly, like, around one table. And that allows you to start building connections. Like, when, you know, when I am circling with some other people, you can chat with the person next to you. And you're going to overhear conversations that are going on in a different way than you wouldn't hear. And, like, when we have a big lecture hall, where we have massive big office hours, you know, you have start to, like, talk to the person next to you and try and maybe I can add, push you along a little bit, and maybe you can push me along a little bit later. Yeah, and I like to say, for me, the biggest challenge of being a TA is just that sometimes you will see students at their worst times during their undergraduate careers because you might be at office hours for a PSET, right? And these students come up to you and they tell you, you know, Charlie, I have five essays, an exam, and, you know, another two problem sets due this week. I have no clue how to do this PSET. I have, you know, if I fail this course, my GPA is going to go down. That will have some impact on my career or anything similar to that. Can you help me? And in those moments, you realize just the gravity and the impact that you have on these students. And you have to make sure you're empathetic, fair, and also helpful all at the same time. And that could be a challenge, especially if you're not specifically trained for these situations. So what we do at Yale, and I'm sure at Harvard as well, is that we specifically prepare our TAs, who are also undergraduate students, to handle these emotionally charged situations in a mature, compassionate, and also responsible manner. And oftentimes I get questions about, you know, why do you have undergraduates as TAs? You know, why not have graduate students, for example, or, um, you know, other professionals from industry to come in and help out? Well, my argument to that is that sometimes you really just need someone who is at the same level as you, right? If you're an undergraduate taking CS50, you're probably going to be able to have more comfort from someone who's also an undergraduate who can be there to help you and guide you through that process. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, so one more question to ask is, why did you all return to staff? So you all have been on staff not just once, but in Patrick's case, like six times. Uh, so why did you come back, and what has kept you being a TA? Mm. You want to go ahead? <laughs> I suppose I was the person mentioned, so I'll go. Um, for me, once, like, uh, yeah, I, in the previous answer, I relayed, like, how I started staff. But what kept me coming back was just, um, like, the whole new kind of community you find in the staff of CS50, rather than in the student body of CS50. Um, again, it's for one thing, it's a, gar it's a gargantuan staff. But like uh, the teacher 
from from like the highest uh, parts of like you know uh, David Malin and Carter right here, the preceptor and things like that, um, down to uh, your fellow like cohort members. In, in the case where you're a head TF like I was uh, last fall, um, either way, the community that's built there is phenomenal and all like all dedicated to the cause of helping people through, as, as you said, it's like some of the most difficult educational experiences they've come up to in their life yet. So yeah, it's for the, it's for the people that I generally have been coming back for things like, you know, uh, CS50 for JDs and CS50 uh, during the summer. Uh, yeah, do you have any more thoughts on that? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, obviously similar for the community is a big aspect and you know, we've been friends from, from CS50 many times. I've done a little bit of a different path instead of doing CS50 six times. I've taught every semester I've been here, but I've picked a different course almost every semester. CS50 is the only one I've been back to twice. So uh, I really enjoy like the you know, the culture and basically all the classes we here we have we have a really good like community vibe um, with all the TFCAs. I think one thing I would add is you actually learn a lot from teaching it. In your case, you might have high school students who might be helping out, uh, which is going to be a little bit different to us. But every time I come back, you know, I, there's always bugs and things that I learn from from other students. I can remember one particular example with someone's Tiedemann piece set, which we were both staring at for over an hour <laughs> in Widener. Couldn't solve it. Got them to give us our e their email. It says 7 p.m. Sat Sunday night. We're sat, I think, in, in your dining hall, trying to work this out. And we finally figured it out uh, and realized that you know, it's actually taught us something about you know, some misconceptions and mistakes that we've made. Um, and you tend to learn a lot from the students. And I think the final product is a great example of that. The creativity that people come up with that, what they put out, is always you know, very impressive. I feel like often I feel like they outdid my final product, which is a bit shameful, but yeah. Yeah, and for me, it's just having the privilege to be part of a student's journey through CS, or maybe not even through CS. And one of the favorite stories that I like to share with everyone uh, when they ask me, you know, why do you want to be a TA, or why do you continue being a TA for CS50, is because my first time TA at Yale for CS50, one of the students in my section um, was a little bit struggling at first with the material, but very quickly caught on and was eventually one of the best students in my section by the end of the semester. And then the following year, uh, they joined the TA team and became a co-TA alongside me. And now, this upcoming fall, they will also be a head TA for CS50. And it's just stories like that that motivate you and inspire you to continue because you really don't know what type of impact you might have on these students. So I thought we'd turn it over to our audience here to ask any questions that you all would like to ask. And feel free to raise your hand and come around and give you the microphone to ask our TAs. Yeah, let me go over there. There you go. So do any of you have like teaching ambitions career-wise? Not particularly. I mean, the, the thing is, like, I, I don't believe like a vast majority of like the CS50 staff have like educational careers in mind necessarily. Certainly not when like the interview process happens. It's much more about the fact that they took the class and kind of just um, want to be part of that uh, experience a little bit further and want to see what it's like to just like um, give back a little bit of what they've uh, taken in uh, to the fellow undergraduates that they have. But um, I don't know. Do either of you? I can take it. Well, I'm one of the rare cases where I uh, absolutely do. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm from the UK, so we don't really have that sort of system, even at like university level. You know, TAs, you would never have an undergrad TA uh, at a UK university, essentially. So it was a very unique opportunity for me, and like it was one of a couple of things which brought me out to the US um, instead of you know studying in London or somewhere else. So I, yeah, like I said, I've TA'd every single semester that I've been in person. I tutor. I do a lot of like tutoring for underprivileged kids kid in Boston. So that's a big program I'm involved with. And yeah, I'm working on like an algorithms and data structures textbook right now. And down the line, um, I hope to be involved in teaching. I think I want like some industry experience and you know, apply my hand and see what I can get up to. And then yeah, I think in 10 years, it wouldn't be a surprise for me to be teaching somewhere. Yeah, that's a really good question because I've asked myself that a lot of times throughout the years. I think if you asked me that my sophomore year, my answer would have been a definite no. But after my junior year last year, I can definitely say for sure that the answer is a strong yes. So, so all with the board. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions too? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, how much work is it, uh, does it involve, and is that on top of your normal course load that you would be taking even if you weren't a TA? Question. I go to you first? Okay. Yeah, so here we have, uh, like at Harvard, we have two roles, right? We have the CAs and the TFs. CAs tend to be five hours of work a week, that's what you're paid. Um, and I think that tends to be pretty accurate. And the same is true for the TFs, where it's instead we have 12 hours. So you tend to add in, what do we say, three hours of grading maybe ish a week. Yeah. Um, yeah, three extra hours of grading, and then you're teaching a section, which is an hour and 15, and then maybe, let's say, an hour, hour and a half for preparation time for that. I think the only thing would be it might get easier every year you do it. Uh, I guess also, like, different for high schools, it might, you might not expect them to return. Whereas undergrads, we have lots of returning members, right? So we provide materials for you to use, but lots of us like making our own. Uh, people have different preferences of slides or how we present material. So that tends to be, uh, you know, a smaller time commitment in future years. Then we only have like small like fluctuations around our big events, right? The hackathon, uh, we have you know overnight shifts, um, and the fair. I think the only two big sort of exceptions to that like five hour, twelve hour week rule. You want to add anything? Um, just that. I mean, I imagine you're all familiar with this exponentially more than I am. But like, there is the thing where um, it's twelve hours a week. But like, if you, a lot of people inevitably like if, if especially like I don't know if their hearts really with their students and things like that will work more and more and more and more um, and the, like the organization's good about about saying like stri like strictly you shouldn't spend this too long on grading uh, try and get through like one submission every X number of minutes and things like that but um yeah it, it's it's tricky when you uh, try and reconcile that kind of numerical stuff with the humanity of the people who are in your section uh, you can kind of fall into a, a, a bit of a <coughs> trap. It's totally manageable, uh, and, and like on top of a course load, uh, things like that. As long as you like, you're budgeting your time correctly and uh, don't try and take on too much at once. But um, yeah, that's the only thing which I imagine you are all <laughs> quite familiar with. So just to add to that, the only I think it's one of the benefits of scale that we might have here yeah. is that you know tutorials might run five minutes over. But there's you know less pressure on me to finish you know get you through a problem set because we have you know 80 staff or however many staff it is and there are tutorials we basically have on like especially on deadline days you have tutorials every hour and we have a system where you can only book one tutorial but once you're out of your tutorial you know you can book a tutorial an hour after so I had people who I <laughs> my students who would come to like my tutorial and then they would get out of the tutorial they would book a tutorial for an hour in advance and go eat dinner as a group, try and solve some stuff as a group over dinner, and then they'll go to another tutorial to try and like, finish, them, finish it off. So I'm not sure you recommend them having a you know, routine for office hours, but in terms of like, we have so many staff and the system is really well organized that like, it's not a massive burden for you to finish like, in your session alone, which is maybe a little bit different to some of the smaller courses. I taught like our algorithms course, and I would stand there like dining hall for like four or five hours at a time sometimes. And for those who don't know our campus-specific language, what's a tutorial? Tutorial is our like small uh, session, like office hours. So it's six people allowed to sign up, and they are 60 minutes. And we tend to put them uh, in the building that we pointed out with the ugly scaffolding. Uh, that's pretty close to like all the undergrad dorms, so we try and make it pretty convenient. The bulk of them are in there. Nice. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Do you think the new duck debugger, AI-based, is going to impact tutoring, TAing? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, I got it. Um, yeah, I mean, like the reason for its inception was to like ease uh, TA burden a little bit because, like, you know, we have a large staff, and and sometimes they can really like they can really buckle under the weight of like all the. Uh, like the massive student body they have to support. Um, I would say, I would say it wouldn't, I, I don't think it, I don't see it like ever like truly intervening, intervening, let alone replacing the human element that's all over CS50. Like there's gonna be a, a ton of staff and a, and, a, and a million like human resources for you all the time, of course. It would be kind of absurd to replace that. Um, I, I do believe that it's, it's a wonderful new resource for people to consult. Uh, when they when they have like especially especially for things maybe like little like syntactic issues um, like 
especially dealing with like ed, um, where you get a lot of questions like that. That will help a lot in terms of uh, easing that burden and making sure that, I don't know, the, th the things that end up uh, as human, like tutorial office hour type interactions are the things that really like could use that, some conceptual misunderstandings, some, you know, some actual teaching moments to be had and things like that, rather than just, you know, uh, the Googleable stuff, as it were. Um, you guys any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's funny because I was just reading a tabloid article last night about how AI is going to replace teachers and uh, you know, re re you know ruin education for years to come. Um, I I do not agree with that <laughs> very clearly, uh, and the reason for that is because I just see the tools that we have and other tools so like the the duck debugger, for example, just serving as a supplement to what TAs already do. So. Um, just for example, like at Yale, we have office hours that are scheduled at certain times of the day, um, but you can't have a TA with you 24-7, right? So if you need help, uh, you can get immediate feedback with you know, specifically tailored information for your problem available to you just from your laptop at any time. And if anything, I just see tools with AI built into it, um, allowing us as humans to have more one-on-one -on -one time with students with more you know, administrative or more commonplace questions being able to go through the AI system instead. Yeah, and we've deliberately like, restrained the duck so that it shouldn't be able to give you large amounts of solutions. So if the duck is able to replace us, then probably you can blame the three of us that we've done our job badly. <laughs> um, alternatively, I'm also waiting for the first time where someone comes up to me and says, you know, how do I solve this problem? And I give them a solution and they say, but the duck told me this. <laughs> and I'm going to say, I helped write the duck. <laughs> Please believe me, this might be your problem. But um, yeah, I think it's going to turn into like, I think my hope is that it's going to turn into like a data point. You know, people can come to me with a, like a Valgrind output. They can come to me with a, like a log of output that they have, uh, like you know, the error log. They can also come to me with what the duck suggests might be wrong, and that's going to help me, you know, help a student like more efficiently, and then it's more spend like as we're hoping for like more time on the like, you know, the ideological like side of things rather than like you're missing semicolons on four lines. Sure, the question was, is the duck multilingual? The duck, in terms of, does it speak multiple programming languages or multiple languages? Language. It speaks multiple languages. For some reason, some languages it prefers to, like, you need to give it a couple of words. I tried to speak it in Spanish. It takes a couple of words for it to realize I'm in Spanish. <laughs> but that's something we're playing with. But yeah, the hope is that it should be able to provide sort of 24-7 feedback or, like, input and also multiple languages. So that should be great. Just to add that, yeah, I'm, I'm like we're aware of like that. There's certain aesthetic problems that you could run into here, where it can appear uh, as though or be presented as though um, like the human element in CS50 is being replaced or outmoded by various AI robots or such. Uh, um, that's something we're really trying to work on, like like being able to present this in a way that doesn't seem uh, overbearing or I don't know a little dy dystopic at worst. Um, yeah, that's something we're, we're still trying to workshop. But to be clear, I mean, as far as, far as I'm, <laughs> I can tell you, um, yeah, we, we do, we'll, we will, we view this and we'll try and implement it uh, the very best we can as something that's like a, a supplement to and an aid to human resources. Uh, something that like helps, you know, office hours, tutorials get to the point and have, uh, and foster some new understanding even better than before, if, I'm, if that makes sense. Other questions? Yeah. Um, you've touched on this briefly in some of your answers, but what challenges do you have, or do you find with working with your peers? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I should say, in, in the context of, you know, you are like in a teaching position to people who are your peers at school. What challenges do you have in that, yeah. that effect? Yeah, sure thing. So it's just um, how do you how do you deal with the challenge of working amongst peers, knowing that you're also a student at the same time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you take it first. Sure. <laughs> I mean, there's certain protocol stuff we do. Like, if you're a super, if if you feel that you can't teach someone or grade them fairly because you're too close a friend with them and you know them from other classes, you you can just throw up a signal and say, hey, I'm, I, sh I shouldn't be in a section with this. I shouldn't be great. Uh, this person shouldn't be in my section, and then we'll trade them out right away. Um, there's things like that. But like, 
are you, are you, are you talking like uh, building a sense of, I don't know, like a teacher-student relationship or an authority, given that you are like just a year ahead of them in, you, in some how, cases? How do you kind of deal with those challenges? Yeah, it, it, it can be tricky. I mean, the thing is that, um, one, you're provided a ton of resources and a ton of connections as far as like being in the staff goes. Um, so you do have a lot of authority to draw from, or a lot of you know resources to draw from in teaching your students, and uh, it's clear uh, that it's clear that everybody in the staff wants to teach uh, teach like teach their fellow undergraduates and wants to uh, present the material in the best possible way. So it's clear that they're you know I don't, I don't know like an, like an ethical appeal or something like that. Um, it can be like balancing that like it would be a little bit. It would be a little bit absurd if we acted 100% professorial all the time. Um, so there's there's balancing that with the obvious like peer to peer connection. But um, generally, like the resources having having a, a lots of TA, TA friends helps a great deal um, with that. Trying to get the balance right, and you know because of the protocol, it, it ends up being like you see these these uh, your people in the section exclusively in this context. So just contextually, it kind of it builds, and then you get on a roll, and it, it, and it smoothed over uh, pretty much fine. Also, most people think you're a senior, even if you're not. <laughs> just for this on pure contextual weight alone. At least I can attest to that. Yeah, so for me at least, when I was a sophomore teen for the first time, I had graduate students in my section. So like, it's me at the front of the classroom and there's 12 people and like two of them are graduate students. Another six are seniors and the rest are like, I mean pretty much everyone's like above my grade level, right? Um, it's definitely intimidating. Um, the way I approach it, and I still approach it today, even though I'll be a rising senior, you know, uh, it's just that everyone in the classroom is equals. Um, just because I'm the teacher doesn't mean that I have any power over you or any authority necessarily. I'm just there to impart the knowledge that I've gathered throughout my time as a student and I guess secondhandly as an educator onto you. Um, and there's many times where I could be wrong in the classroom. Um, and it, I think it's just important to just stay grounded and remember that everyone in this classroom is learning at the same time. You just happen to have a little bit more background and experience that you can share with others. But it doesn't make you any different. Okay, Charlie kind of stole my point, so he beat me to it. So um, I guess I would say, like, just in terms of like support structures, like touching on what Patrick said of like having other TAs we know. I think one of our best like changes that we made with the cohort system that we had. So we had like groups of six, seven TFs uh, led by head TF. And really, like having those weekly check-ins, it would often like go and like grab you know coffee or grab some snacks every week, and that was really a good place to like talk with other TAs, and without like you know a senior member of staff, we're all students there, um, you know obviously the head TF sort of took the lead on that, but that was a really good place to like spread information and like if you wanted to, you know if there was something you weren't comfortable with, you could kind of offload it somewhere at the same level. You can always escalate up to we have the heads email, which is great. Like if you don't have a if you don't know what to deal with a problem. Send it to heads. That's that's what you're told, um, and that works great because the head TFs really know what they're doing. They've normally taught a couple of times before, or six times before, um, and also then you know you can kind of go out to other TAs. And often, if you work, if you do your tutorials like in either like in Widener, there'll be many many TAs there to help. If you don't know how to do something, like Tiedemann is a classic piece at which the TFs still struggle with, and you know. It's, we, we often run a, a Tiedemann specialist table uh, in Widener, so you can get that sort of support um, yeah, from higher up, heads, uh, Carter, or you, you know, go to your cohort and see if they can help you. Thank you, Robin. So we'll take one more question, I think, from the Zoom yeah. chat back here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the Zoom chat question is from Burn, Sorry, can we contain the microphone? Sure. Yeah. The question is, with your experience, how much extra support should a student get after lecture and class to get the most out of CS50? Let me run this back up here. Well, <laughs> I'm first again. Um, oh, you don't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, well, on a structural level, like within the class itself, uh, there's a ton of support already being provided after lecture and class. Namely, there's office hours and tutorials and sections. Um, there's the ed forum that people can go to anytime. Now there's a duck. Um, so, yeah, on a structural level, there's tons of support already. Um, it varies from TA, in my experience, it varies from TA to TA how much support 
like their in, like the individual staff members will provide to students outside of all of that context, uh, which is already quite robust. So if you want, um, yes, this kind of depends on your approach, I suppose, because uh, there's enough, there's certainly enough uh, support at like the class structural level that you can give your uh, students uh, all the support they need just within like official tutorials and sections that are that are um, very wide ranging and helpful. Um, some people like to say like at, at the very least I say like my email is open anytime and then you can respond from there. Uh, some people give their phone numbers things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is so individual. I kind of want to toss it off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talked a little. You talked a little bit about the variety in terms of TAs. There's also like a massive variety in terms of what the students approach to the classes. Um, Patrick and I have taken many classes together, and we still have exactly the opposite approach to how we take a class. I would start the, I would open the P set and download it on the Monday. Patrick would open and download the P set on the Sunday, and that you know, <laughs> that informs a little bit about how you know you, you want to support that student. I mean, if they come in with significant significant background, then often you know just a lecture, and you can have a go at the P set, and maybe tutorials is the way to go. If you're one of the weakest students, and that's why we have like the least comfortable, less, m more comfortable, and most comfortable sections, we can kind of tailor that towards you. And obviously, again, the sort of scale that we have here with 700 students, we have that luxury that we can scale, you know, into different categories and provide sort of different levels of support. For the most comfortable students, we might take you beyond to the scope of CS50 within our section. For the least comfortable, it will really be about, you know, getting to pass check 50, passing style 50. What can we do to make sure you do that? And you know, maybe that'll be running extra long section, and maybe that'll be you know walking through the first section of the code. I had a, like a least comfortable section for finance. I walk, we coded the first like application, I think register, in section together, and I think it's totally reasonable to do. And most comfortable, you would expect them to fly off and do that themselves. And I think to answer the question a little bit more broadly too, I I'm a big proponent of supplemental. Uh, small group instruction on top of large lecture instruction, especially for introductory computer science classes, because at the end of the day, you can be one of the world's best instructors if you're teaching a large lecture class, but the vast majority of students in that classroom are either not paying attention or they are paying attention and something flew over their heads at some point and they can't interrupt you or they're too afraid to interrupt you, right? Because they're sitting among, you know, hundreds of their peers, you know, or, you know, quite a large amount of them and they just don't want to ask that question at that time. So what I like to keep in mind when approaching small group instruction is just assume that the people in your classroom for that small group instruction are starting from the same level, which is quite low in terms of understanding, and build up from there. Because at the end of the day, if you're assuming that your students will memorize 100% of what you taught in lecture, I guarantee you your results are not going to be what you're expecting, unfortunately. So. All right, thank you, Charlie. And let me just thank our entire TA team here. Thank you. Um, so that'll conclude our um, panel on building a TA program. If you have any more questions, though, certainly feel free to ask these guys anytime later, too.